I guess my response with all respect to um, Sue Gordon, I know um, obviously a trailblazer as a magistrate, yeah. I also um, think it should be noted that she was um, an advisor to very conservative prime ministers. Yeah. Um, so she doesn't completely stand outside of these political structures. She is a conservative voice. So when we're juxtaposing them, that we're taking Lydia Thorpe's voice and Sue Gordon's voice, but she also does have direct experience with child protection matters. Yeah, and I, and I would say that um, there, there are absolutely um, aspects of her statement that ring true, and, th and that is that the level of direct racism is um, not as apparent today. Um, we have um, neutral welfare laws that apply universally. However, we also have systemic racism and systemic racism is unconscious, it's implicit, and it exists because of dominant, of adherence to dominant values and adherence to certain stereotypes. And those values often um, presume that Aboriginal families because of their structure or because of um, situations like poverty and housing, um, that they can't provide the same level of parenting as non-Aboriginal families. So that's a, that's a value judgment that's made every single day by, um, we have what, what's called Department of Family and Community Service or Department of Justice or Department of Community Services, various names across the country. Yeah. That kind of value judgment is made every day when children are removed or when authorities um, choose to intervene with families. So we could say that um, Aboriginal people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are 10 times more neglectful of parents. But the reality is that all the evidence points to the opposite, that removing children creates the harm. So when we look at compar comparable cases, we see that Aboriginal children who are removed much more likely to suffer from mental health issues, to suffer from um, poverty, unemployment, low education, um, and, and also to get caught up in the youth justice and the adult prison system. Um, so the evidence suggests that um, removing children does not help their well-being and in fact harms them. But what's even worse, and we've seen this recently in the Northern Territory, but it's much, much more rife than that, is that um, many of these children into foster homes that abuse them. Um, and so the intergenerational trauma we often talk about is not only the removal, but it's also um, going into families, often well-paid foster families that um, physically, sexually and emotionally abuse um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. Um, so it seems that while the um, policy is not directed towards Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families, the effect and the practices within those systems target the families. It, it's dis, it becomes disproportionate because of the universality, because I suppose I would, um, I would think having worked with child protection and alongside them, more in a role of trying to keep children. So I agree with you. So I think it's with child protection services, we're stuck. You know, and I think this this applies not only to Indigenous children, but to non-Indigenous children as well. That yes. we don't necessarily get better outcomes by removing children from families. Um, and yes. them either in residential care, which is the probably the worst case situation, or in foster care, even though there are some, you know, exceptional foster carers out there. 